So this video is going to be talking about prostate cancer screening, which uh, is uh, all in the news uh, based on the task force's uh, recommendation. And while I do weekly video, I'm assuming that uh, at least some of you don't know that and don't know who I am. You're just attracted by the subject matter. So I think it's important for you to know who I am and where I'm coming from. I'm a 68-year-old medical oncologist. Uh, I treat prostate cancer patients exclusively. I have a clinic, therefore, full of men with cancer recurrent after surgery or radiation who are trying to stay alive and maintain the best quality of life possible. I'm also a prostate cancer patient. I was diagnosed in 99 with cancer that had spread to my lymph nodes. Uh, I happened to be disease-free, but my disease was uh, diagnosed at a fairly advanced stage because I neglected to go for screening. So. Clearly, I have a bias. Uh, I have a horse in this race. It's interesting because, of course, if people don't screen for prostate cancer, there'll be many more patients with recurrent or advanced disease. So what the task force has done is uh, guarantee that there'll be plenty of business in my clinic. Uh, so uh, unlike maybe perhaps some urologists, I'm not going to lose income because of these recommendations. Uh, but I'm filled with a terrible sense of foreboding about the needless suffering and deaths that the recommendations cause. So I got up on the website, I read their report, and you know, I'm in this business. I know these studies, I've been following it. Uh, I'm a patient, so I'm passionately involved. In, talk about boring, dull, dry. Uh, they clearly hadn't gotten much into their material. And it was the class reading this, you could just tell they hadn't seen the forest for the trees. They're just looking at the trees, not the forest. They don't see the big picture. Uh, so rather than delve into the details of the studies, uh, which I'm going to do in our newsletter, I'd like to talk about the big picture. Because if you take the big picture, the craziness of this thing is just overwhelming. Uh, so, every year since 1990, there have been between 20 and 35,000 deaths from prostate cancer every year. That's not a minor problem. It puts prostate cancer uh, right up there with lung and colon cancer as the three major causes of prostate cancer, I mean of cancer deaths in the United States one of the top ten causes of death among men. Uh, so this belies the, the, in, in the implications of the task force report that this is an indolent, slow-growing disease that does no harm. So why is there this conflict between the mortality figures and the vision of the disease portrayed in the report? Well, unfortunately, Prostate cancer is complex. There are two different forms of the disease. Uh, at one extreme, there's an extremely common uh, form of prostate cancer that's very slow growing, doesn't spread. It's about as common as gray hair, part of normal male aging, never going to cause a medical problem, never going to cause a symptom, and doesn't need to be diagnosed and treated. There's a less common form of the disease, which is aggressive, relentlessly growing, and will kill you if you don't get rid of it. The best analogy I, I, I can come up with is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator. Prostate cancer in this form is the Terminator, and it will get you if you don't get it. And it's the contrast between these two. So what this task force has decided uh, is that uh, to focus on the benefits of the common indolent cancer and ignore the problem of the lethal and advanced disease. Greater common good. Except in the process, they're ignoring one of the three major causes of cancer deaths in men. And that's what's crazy. Now, what is the nature of this highly lethal form of prostate cancer that my patients are in battle with. Well, this is a situation 
where if the, we detect it early enough, surgery and radiation therapy can cure every patient, or essentially every patient. Unfortunately, our tools today aren't perfect. Still, if you take the practices of the best centers and put them in place around the country, and this is something that can be done. Instead of losing 30,000 men a year, we lose 3,000. We could reduce the death rate by 90%. You just have to go to read Pat Walsh's papers, for example, or other great other major surgeons. Look at their 5 and 10 year, 15 year data. Radiation therapy, we've got 15 year disease free data on radiation therapy now. So this form of the disease is completely curable if you catch it early enough, but with what we know today, death rates could be reduced by 90%. So what I'd love to see is us detect those nasty cancers and get rid of them using the best. So we ought to be concentrating on taking the best practices of the best places and making them the community practice. Instead, we're going the other way. So, one of the major arguments the task force makes, and indeed people who oppose to screening in general make, is that once we make the diagnosis, we can't tell the indolent cancer from the aggressive cancer. Bullshit. <laughs> I mean, it's just this, it's crazy. I don't know how do they say that. The urologists have done a superb job of setting up a set of guidelines to do a pretty good job of identifying the relative risk of disease. American Neurologic Society's website is a great resource. They've done a wonderful job of making that available to the public. The Gleason scoring system, the height of the PSA, the all sorts of tools we have, they're not perfect. Some people we think have indolent disease, actually have nasty disease. So a portion of the people who are diagnosed with low grade, we think are low grade disease, have nasty disease, will progress and get into trouble. On the other hand, there's no problem the other way. If you've got a Gleason 7, 8, or 9, 10, uh, your PSA is rising fast, we know you're in trouble. Uh, so. Uh, I, I think, again, it, it's as though they don't, haven't bothered to put in the time to acquaint themselves with what we currently know about tracking people. Uh, so we can do that. Now, the problem is at the community level. There's no question that men with indolent, slow-growing cancers are being subjected to needle surgery and radiation therapy. There is no excuse for a surgeon to tell a patient with a small Gleason 6 that he needs surgery. There's no excuse for that. So our problem in America is to educate or police physicians at the local level to make sure the overtreatment doesn't occur. Not to ignore the problem and allow 20 or 30,000 men in America to die needlessly. And that's what the task force has decided to do. Just crazy. Almost as bad as the recommendations in terms of breast cancer screening. Same callous disregard for the fate of cancer patients. So I hope that's as clear thus far. The problem is that not that the PSA test is not useful. It identifies people at high risk of the disease. It leads to the detection of cancer. It will save lives if we do the best that we can do. We can avoid unnecessary treatment for people with low-grade disease. The problem is that some of the people we think have low-grade disease don't. Now, if you want to read further on this, Mark Scholes, my friend and colleague, has written a nice book called The Prostate Snatch Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers, available from Amazon. And it's a nice discussion of what we need to do to keep the people with slow-growing disease from unnecessary treatment. That's not my focus today. 
I want to make sure we're not going to have more patients like the ones in my clinic suffering with advanced disease needlessly because of nonsense like this. Now, uh, I'd like to pass on to the, the, the next aspect of this uh, because there's something behind this. In our society today, uh, there is a bias against old men. And at 68, I see this. It's pervasive. Once men are no longer of economic value to our society, we're going to be discarded. You see this in the screening reports like this. You see it in the current administration's desire to reduce spending for men over age 80 in Medicare. The old can be put out to wait the, to the pastures and let nature take its course. Oh, it's not worth if you're if you're sev over 75, we shouldn't do anything to protect you. Uh, it's crazy because, of course, we now know that if you're 70 in good health and practicing healthy practices, you've got a 50% chance of reaching 90. So rather than telling people that they don't need to worry about their health, we should implement what we already know about how to improve the health of those people in their 70s and 80s. Another issue here, uh, and, and this is really fills me with deep anger. We're the Vietnam generation. I didn't serve in Vietnam. I was identified as a promising scientist and allowed to serve my military at the uh, NIH where I became a, a scientist of some success. But many of my friends and classmates did serve in Vietnam and many of them died and many of them came home broken men. And the ones who didn't still had paid a debt to society. The way we treated the soldiers when they came home from Vietnam was terrible. It looks poorly on our society. Again, as I've said in previous videos, I'm an independent. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm middle of the road. And while I wasn't excited about the war in Vietnam, I thought that a lot of my friends and colleagues who served their country in what was a frustrating war. We were treated badly as a generation. We all came back, they all came back from Vietnam. Everybody settled down to work. And it was my generation that was responsible for the blossoming of America in the 1980s and 1990s. Sure, Reagan and Clinton get credit as leaders but it was the work of my generation that made America rise up from the ashes of the late 70s and come to redominate the world. Now my generation is facing retirement. And we get messages like this. Oh, you're over 70, over oh, you're 75. We're not going to even try and keep you alive. It just repeats the lesson of Vietnam. And it reflects very poorly on our culture. Because you can be sure that the younger generation is watching how we're treating, being treated. And they're not going to be willing to step up to the plate. Because they'd be foolish to step up to the plate. So, we have the, in my generation is facing a loss of their retirement benefits because of corruption in D.C. and Wall Street. Everybody focuses on Wall Street. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Wall Street only stunk because of the corruption in Congress and to a lesser extent the White House. So rightly, Americans have no respect for Congress. So this task force is just one more straw on the back of people of my generation who did what they were asked and propelled our country back to leadership and were being betrayed by our leaders. So I am extremely angry about this report, both because of the report itself and the context with which the report exists and what it says about how America treats its citizens when they step up to the plate and perform like my generation did. Thank you.